Our next speaker is going to be Giovanni Molinari, and he's going to also be talking about um, larval largemouth bass rearing. Um, he's going to tell us about experiments in recirculating aquaculture systems. Okay, is everyone able to see it? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so this talk um, will actually focus on rearing larval largemouth bass in the indoor RAS system. So it actually uh, follows Dr. Coyle's uh, last couple of slides pretty well, because he mentioned seeing how we can improve raising these fish in a RAS system. Um, I know many people obviously before me have mentioned this, but I'm still gonna kind of just do a quick overview of the current practices. Uh, initially, these larval largemouth bass are stocked in nursery ponds. Uh, and those ponds are fertilized in order to produce abundant live feed. Uh, feed is pretty much the main limiting factor in uh, larval rearing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and then typically around one to two inches, the bass are then stocked into feed training tanks. And this is, so the broad indoors, um, it just adds another step of transport. It's a little bit stressful uh, and then also pretty um, expensive as well. But in these feed training tanks, they're trained with floating or slowly sinking pellets. Uh, bass typically don't eat feed off the bottom. So the longer that the feeds can either stay at the top or sinking slowly through the water column, uh, the more likely they are to be consumed and uh, the fish can be trained a little bit better. Uh, and especially during this stage, a high protein and a large, low carb diet uh, works best for these fish. And then once they're feed trained, they're moved back outdoors to grow up ponds. This is where the densities are reduced. Um, and then they're fed these formulated dry diets. And this is where they're grown to their target size, whether for stocking or, or live market or, or something like that. So it's uh, outdoors, indoor for feed training, and then back outdoors for ponds. Oh, it's gonna work. oh never mind. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages to the system. There's a reason it's been going on uh, for I mean, up until this point, it's a low tech method and also uh, less labor intensive than other culture systems. Uh, both of those do a, uh, go a long ways to reducing costs. Obviously, uh, the economics of this whole thing is very important. So that's what that's going to come up a lot as I'm uh, focusing on what we're doing. Also it represents a relatively natural habitat. Obviously, a pond compared to a tank is uh, much more natural. Uh, outdoors in a pond than in, inside in a tank. And then also the, the natural live feed culture. It's still paramount to maintain that live feed culture in the ponds, but um, it's a little bit easier to keep more abundant numbers because it's in a pond, you have natural um, nutrients and life cycles kind of maintaining that live feed culture. So it's a little bit uh, more cost effective to maintain live feed cultures in ponds than in tanks. Uh, obviously, there's some disadvantages too. A lot of the disadvantages come from uh, just control, lack of control, having to do a lot of stuff outside. Uh, you're really at the mercy of Mother Nature at some points. Um, predators, pathogens can be introduced, uh, like flooding, algal blooms, temperature swings, stuff like that can uh, really make your survival and production uh, pretty variable. And that's not something you want when you're trying to uh, keep producing consistent numbers uh, year to year. Uh, another thing too is high land usage. As aquaculture continues to grow, uh, one of the limiting factors is uh, land availability. So if we can maximize our production to land usage uh, ratio, that would really go a long ways to um, growing the field of aquaculture. And another thing as well is monitoring your stock numbers. When your fish are out in ponds, um, obviously you can observe some mortalities, um, just seeing like what's on top or what washes the side, but uh, it's difficult to observe the fish every day and really see how they're doing. So taking those disadvantages and hoping to uh, improve on those by moving indoors. So some of the advantages of indoor aquaculture is uh, just as the main disadvantage for outdoor was lack of control. The main advantage for indoor is uh, much, much greater control. You can control your water quality much easier you control your temperature, your photo period, uh, and that can allow for a year round culture. You're not reliant on uh, natural temperatures. And it also incre uh, increases the range that fish can be raised. Um, I think someone mentioned previously, people in Ohio, if they're trying to raise bass, they can really only do it in the summer. Um, 
so now year round, pretty much wherever you are geographically, uh, you'd be able to raise largemouth bass. Uh, then also the more efficient space usage, uh, you can stock at higher densities in these tanks. Um, so it's more efficient use of the space. Obviously it, then from there, it's also important to maximize your production at these high densities because density dependent um, factors do play a part. Uh, then also high biosecurity. That, that's another function of control, but uh, larval fish are very susceptible to um, infections and diseases. So anything you can do to reduce the chances of anything being introduced to your system uh, would be very beneficial towards producing a high quality larva. Uh, the main or a common indoor uh, aquaculture system is a RAS system, which is a re recirculating aquaculture system. So there's Every system is different. Some have more components and some have um, fewer components, but really there's four main stages to a RAS system that are important. The first stage is obviously um, the grow tank. This is where the fish are kept. Obviously the incoming water enters. Uh, and then from that grow tank, uh, water is constantly being circulated out. And that brings out the fish waste or the uneaten feed or just any solids that build up in that tank. And so that, that outflow then the first step of filtering would be the solid removal phase. And this can be done a couple ways. Uh, a lot of places have a sump, which is where um, really the water is just kind of held and the solids settle out. From there, it can be moved either through a mat filter, which will help remove solids um, or a sand filter, which is actually what we use. And I have uh, pictures of later on in the presentation. Just, uh, so take the water out, remove the solids before uh, being further processed. Once the solids are removed, uh, it is the next filtration system is biofiltration. And this is done to remove ammonia for the water because if you're constantly recirculating water from 20, 30, 100 tanks, um, ammonia is gonna build up as waste is being produced and everything. So in order to reuse that water, you need to remove the ammonia. So we do this by using nitrogen fixing bacteria um, in a tank, the water's uh, filtered through there the bacteria act on the ammonia and produce uh, a harmless form of nitrogen, which can be either aerated out or, um, oh yeah, pretty much is aerated out. So that's how we remove the solids and the ammonia. And then the last step before that is just to reoxygenate uh, the water, to remove the CO2, put more oxygen back in the water before it is then finally recirculated back into the tanks. Um, like I said, every system's different and I'll kind of run through our specific systems, but uh, there's a few extra steps that people can use, but this is the general overview of uh, RAS systems. Uh, there's also some disadvantages to in intensive indoor aquaculture. Like I said, economics play a big part in this. And with this indoor culture, it's very expensive. It's a complex system. This higher technology can be very expensive and also expensive to maintain as well. Uh, very labor intensive too, to maintain water quality, uh, just, just, and then pretty much just maintain your system. And then also live feed culture. Live feed is very expensive to maintain. That comes with its own set of um, labor costs, uh, feed input costs. So really the main disadvantage is why you have all this control is a lot of increased costs. So pretty much the main idea that um, my lab is kind of dealing with that is if we can reduce some of these costs to a realistic point and then also improve production enough to help offset these costs, uh, we think we can make the indoor um, larva culture for largemouth bass uh, a more profitable situation than current practices outdoor. Uh, so the first very important start part of the live feed or larval stage is live feed. Um, and that's one of the main causes for indoor culture is having to produce our own live feed. Successful larva rearing is dependent on live feed and successful larva rearing is the most important part of any successful aquaculture system. In order to produce high quality juveniles and adults, you must produce high quality larva. Uh, many of the fish species require this live feed. Typically it's, it's zooplankton like Artemia or rotifers. Uh, I think I'll, I'll talk about what we use. We actually use our team and I'll talk about that on the next slide. 
Uh, a lot of advantages come with this live feed. The main one is they actually provide digestive enzymes for the larval fish. Uh, that's a main point that'll come up in the second experiment I talk about. Uh, so I can talk about it a little bit more there, but also the mobility throughout the water column. Uh, larval largemouth bass, they don't swim too well and also uh, they don't see too well. So anything that helps with an easier detec detection of these uh, live feed is important. Uh, and so these live feed can stay in the water column, swim around, uh, much more easily detectable. And then also they can trigger feeding response. They have short, twitchy, like jerky motions that trigger that natural feeding response in bass uh, and just, yeah, make them much more readily consumed than, than dry feed. Like I said, this is uh, what we use for our bass cultures, our timi and or brine shrimp. Uh, there's a picture on the left. Those are just uh, under a microscope. And then the picture on the right is actually a picture of our system that I, that I took yesterday. We're, we're currently raising larval walleye right now. So we're also using our timia. Typically this can be done in either big cones like we have on the, on the left or small McDonald jars on the right. It's, uh, it's a pretty simple process to do. We add cysts to salt water, about 30 PPT, have a consistent light source, um, add the heater, and then just consistently aerate. And after about 24 hours, we were able to harvest the hatched Artemia and feed them out. Uh, while it is a simple process, it's still pretty labor intensive to maintain. And then also just to give you guys an idea of how much uh, Artemia these fish go through, I had a 12 tank, 1250 liter tank system. Uh, and I went through about six of those small McDonald jars on the right uh, a day for um, just to maintain the live feed presence in the water. So it can, it can amount to a lot of live feed. So from there, from everything we've talked about with live feed, reducing costs, um, one of the ideas that we had is to see if we can just introduce these fish, feed train them earlier, um, and just kind of mitigate the use of um, the live feed a little bit, and then also uh, re uh, remove the feed training step from the, from the protocol. So current knowledge um, from a couple of papers, obviously a couple of people also spoke today, uh, lar larva can be transitioned after about two weeks to uh, a starter diet like Otohime B, um, and that was seen with uh, about 70% survival or above 50, um, which, is, which is still very good. So we're just seeing if we can um, make it just in, introduce a dry feed early on and see pretty much how they perform and how they respond to it. So experimental design for the study was uh, very simple. We had two groups, one group from five days post hatch, which was our first feeding to 25 days post hatch was fed with just Artemia nuclei. Um, and then our second group was the co-feeding group. So for the first two days, um, from five to seven days post-hatch, they were just fed with Artemia. And then on, on that seventh day, they did um, introduce formulated dry pellets and they were co-fed for the rest of the study until 25 days post-hatch. Uh, just some specifics for how we did this. So the densities, we did a volumetric uh, uh, distribution for the tanks. So our stocking densities ended up around 867 larvae in a 50 liter tank. We kept our photo period from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the fish were fed every two hours, which came out to six times a day, and they were fed to observe satiation. So pretty much until they, we noticed they stopped feeding, we would then we'd back off. Uh, another key point is um, the tanks were cleaned three times a day during this stage, and that was to maintain water quality and prevent fungal growth. As I mentioned, the larval fish are very susceptible to infections in the water and uh, any decomposing feed at the bottom or decomposing or teaming at the bottom can produce a lot of risk in the water. So the, the tanks were cleaned three times a day, which is obviously very labor intensive and definitely factors into the end game of this whole research. The diets we used uh, was a fish meal based diet. It was formulated based on other larval commercial feeds. Um, as you can see, it was, it came out to about 54 and a half percent protein uh, and about 17 percent lipids. And then there on the left, you can see the, the feed sizes. It was about, it was under 150 micrometers for, uh, um, 
the first five days and then we bumped it up to 150 to 250 micrometers. So it was a very fine powder that we were feeding. Uh, so these pictures are from our system. I'll kind of run through each one. On the far left, we have our, oh, actually I have a mouse, yeah. So uh, down here, the first step is our mechanical filters. Uh, we have two sand filters that um, allowed us to remove all the solids from the water being removed from the tanks. Uh, we also had a sump, it's kind of hard to see, but it's, it's down here and that allowed a lot of the particles to settle out as well. From the sand filter, the, uh, the water would go to these two big tanks up here. And those two tanks contained our bio balls, which um, had our uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria on them. And those tanks are heavily aerated to one, just maintain the, those bacteria um, and also, um, yeah, just allow the bacteria to act on the ammonia, remove it from the system um, so it didn't build up in, uh, in the tanks. Uh, this middle picture is just pretty much a general view of the system. It was a 40 tank system in those small blue tanks. The tanks are actually 100 liters, but we filled them up halfway just to keep the, um, just so we could have smaller densities in, in each tank and uh, easier to maintain pretty much. On the far right, that's uh, close up of our tank. So the features of this, we had a standpipe which, with a fine mesh that just prevented uh, a lot of feed from washing out and then also from, um, well, feed from prematurely washing out and then also larval fish from washing out. Another thing that we did, uh, because larval rearing in indoor systems is still relatively new, we found we were doing a lot of, um, I'm sure everybody uh, listening has done this, a lot of problem solving. So we're just seeing kind of how they acted and then adjusting based on that. So one thing we found is that these large mud bass were pretty susceptible to sticking to the mesh uh, just because they can't swim that well and any outflowing water would would kind of drive into the mesh. So we put the air stone right next to the standpipe and that kind of bubbling prevented them from sticking to the air pipe. So that was just a, a feature we had to use to um, just to maintain them in the water column and not stuck on the mesh. Uh, I also outlined our conditions there to the, on the left, our temperature and pH were kept at optimal levels. Uh, one thing that we did do, we kept the salinity between one and three parts per thousand. And that was due to a study from Dabrowski and Miller. Uh, and they just pretty much stated that maintaining a salinity um, at that stage or at that level during the live feed stage increases the viability of these live feed um, keeps them alive longer and keeps them in the water column longer. So just improves the uh, viability of them and makes them easier to, to detect and be eaten. Um, also, obviously there's a lot of health benefits to keeping salinity that high, so, um, or that at that level. So it was just a beneficial situation overall. So our results from that study, uh, for this study, we just looked at growth and survival as our parameters. Um, you can see, my values here, the dry feed, the co-feeding group performed actually much better than the, uh, than the solely live feed group, uh, had a, about a 70% higher weight at the end of the study, uh, then obviously a, a much higher weight gain as well. While those numbers weren't significant, statistically, obviously it's uh, pretty, a pretty high enough increase to uh, catch our eye and really think about co-feeding as they, um, is a good larval practice in the future. And uh, then another key point uh, was the survival. We did, uh, this was a very labor intensive larval rearing study, um, really focusing on how we can optimize the survival of these large mouth, ba large mouth bass in the indoor system. Uh, and actually that co-feeding group had a 98% survival um, and with a very relatively low standard deviation, it was the tanks, the treatments were done in triplicates and I think the survival was around 97, 98, and 98 for the, or 98, 97, 99 among the three tanks. So very high survival all around, but that was a function of um, very labor intensive feeding and cleaning. So, uh, so it's something to keep an eye on, but we were very happy to get that level of survival. So some conclusions we can take from that. Uh, one, at just seven days post hatch, they were able to accept that dry feed. So after only two days of feeding on live feed, uh, really a benefit of this is that from uh, this larval culture, uh, at 25 days post hatch, these fish were feed trained fingerlings and um, could immediately be transferred to formulated diets, uh, whether in grow tanks or, or out to a pond. Um, so that just helps skip that expensive step of feed training 
because actually the, the two groups used in this larval study were then um, were used for another st study immediately following that larval stage where they were switched directly to dry feed and they, we were able to get them up to like 150 grams um, by the end of the study. And I think it went about like four, four or five months. So right after they were able to be feeding on dry pellets, uh, then also that significantly higher survival. Like I said, a lot of it is reducing costs as much as possible with the indoor larva culture, uh, and then also increasing production as a way to make it more economically feasible. So if we can get that high of a survival in the larval stage, um, obviously that can increase production uh, and that increase in production can go a long way to uh, mitigating some of those uh, increasing costs. Uh, and then also at the bottom, like I said, it was a very labor intensive process. We, we did it on purpose, make it very labor intensive, see how high we can get survival. Essentially what we're doing is just trying to uh, find the hard way to do it so that eventually we can find the easy way to do it. Do it the hard way first and then keep problem solving so we can find an easy way to do it. Okay, so from that study and the conclusions we were able to make there, our next idea was um, what if we can completely replace live feed uh, just from the start? So no, no live feed in the beginning, dry feed it uh, right at the start. There'd be a lot of benefits to this. Um, one, the nutritional requirements of larval fish are uh, much higher and much, much more important during this stage because they're going through so much development, metamorphosis and growth. So their energy requirements are very high. Live feed is very variable and obviously difficult to control as far as nutritional um, profile. So if we can give them and develop formulated diets, we can give them a more optimal nutritional profile and then also have more control over uh, what they're being fed. Uh, additionally, reduced risk of exposure. Uh, anytime you're adding a live organism to a system that comes with inherent risk of exposure to disease or infection, especially with how um, how some live feed are raised, rotifers, uh, it can be a relatively dirty-ish uh, system um, with just a lot of room for pathogens or disease. So this would remove that risk uh, and then also reduce the cost associated with culturing live feed, which comes with a lot of labor. Uh, you have to feed the live feed, so you're having a, a whole nother feed cost. And then also obviously the cost of starting these, like getting the seedling um, like cysts or, or rotifers. So. It would just help to reduce costs and just ultimately be more beneficial to do dry feed right away. So that's what our second experiment focused on was replacing this live feed. It's been done before in other fish species. Uh, I believe that first paper was on catfish and then the next one uh, was on sea bream or, or tilapia. I actually I think it was on sea bream, but pretty much all the way around these studies have found that without live feed at the start, uh, there have been significant reductions in growth and survival. And so obviously that made us wonder why, what's wrong with dry feeds? Why can't they be using larva rearing? And uh, there's actually a couple pretty good reasons for it. One is just that the fish do not readily accept that dry feed as well. Uh, you can make the best, most optimal feed in the world. And if they don't eat it, then, then it doesn't work. So, and this just comes from a lack of natural response. As I said, the, um, the artemia or the zooplankton, it's kind of jerky and twitchy and it swims. So they kind of triggers a natural response to go after it, uh, whereas a sinking pellet doesn't. Uh, then also it can lack palatability compared to, um, compared to live feed. Another main thing, and back at the very beginning of this presentation when I said um, the live feed provide their own digestive enzymes to the larval fish, that's very important because especially with larval bass, their digestive tracts are still developing throughout this larval stage. So they don't have those digestive enzymes readily available to break down these complex diets and especially complex proteins. So in this stage when protein input and energy input is so important for the production of um, healthy larva and then into healthy juveniles, breaking down and absorbing these proteins is, uh, is very, very important. So, um, so that's why live feed is so good, provide their own enzymes and um, can actually help digest themselves within the, within the um, larval gut. Uh, and then additionally, another point is that dry feeds tend to uh, decrease the ability to inflate the swim bladder. And that's just a function of um, a film created at the top from these dry feeds, just from stuff leaching out, uh, which could help make surface tension and prevent fish from inflating their swim bladder. 
so the objective of this study was uh, to see if we can develop an optimal formulated diet to replace the live feed uh, for these bats at the first feeding. The theory behind our formulations was uh, the use of muscle hydrolysis. So it's utilizing these hydrolyzed or, or pre-digested fish protein. Um, and we think that would be, that could improve then the utilization of these, um, of these diets. Uh, essentially it's taking fish muscle and then digesting them with the endogenous, endogenous enzymes extracted from the digestive tracts of the adult fish. So while the larval bass don't have um, the developed digestive enzymes, if we digest complex protein with the enzymes that they're going to develop, so the enzymes of their adults, of the adults of the same species, um, in theory, it would break the proteins down in the right way that it would increase absorption into the, um, into the body. So that, that's our theory behind it. Fish muscle hydrolysis have been looked at before in, in a couple studies. Uh, it's widely used as an attractant to increase palatability. So that would help um, improve what, yeah, so the palatability and the acceptance of this dry diet um, at first feeding. And then also it would provide an optimal amino acid profile. One of another hindrance on formulating larval dry diets is that nutritional requirements of larval fish are difficult to, uh, difficult to learn, I guess, because they're so much different than the juveniles and the adults of the same species. Uh, so ideally, the amino acid profile in the adult muscle of the same species would be the um, optimal amino acid profile uh, for dietary needs. Um, so that's kind of the idea there. And then um, lastly, it would just provide the smaller protein sizes. So pre-digested, it, um, it would digest it for them and hopefully make it easier for them to, to digest and absorb. So this figure kind of, uh, it represents our process for how we did these hydrolysis. Um, we had adult largemouth bass kept at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, the day of harvesting, they were fed twice in the morning and then harvested one hour after feeding. And that was to get um, just their dig digestive enzymes going by feeding them, they're already digesting, uh, and then harvesting them pretty much during that digestive process to get the most enzymes possible. Um, and then, yeah, and then hydrolysis occurred the same day uh, as they were harvested. And so in this figure, we have uh, two inputs going into this mixture. We have the muscle from largemouth bass. It was uh, ground up a couple times to make it um, pretty uniform and then homogenized with water to create a solution. And then the same thing with our digestive tracts. It was homogenized with water. Uh, additionally, the digestive tracts were centrifuged and this helped remove obviously the tissue from the digestive tract and then like the uneaten feed or the undigested feed. And so we took that supernatant and that supernatant is what we call their enzymatic cocktail. So that was the enzymes we used for our, our homogenation. So there was just centrifuge from this um, homogenized fish guts. So then we mixed our supernatant and mussels. Um, and then half of that, that, super, that enzyme and muscle mix was removed and that, uh, and that sample was in our intact hydrolysis. So that's it did not go on any, or sorry, not intact hydrolysis, intact protein. So it didn't go undergo any hydrolysis. It was immediately um, heat shocked at 90 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes to eliminate en any enzymatic activity. And this represented our control protein source, um, not pre-digested, so it was complex protein. Uh, the other part, our hydrolysis, um, after it was mixed, we mimicked largemouth bass digestion. So we kept it at 25 degrees Celsius to match the temperature they were kept at in their tanks. Uh, the first hour was um, mixed stomach digestion. So we continuously mixed the, um, the mixture and then maintained a pH of three to four so that all the stomach enzymes within, the, uh, within our enzymatic cocktail, um, so that's how, so they could start working first. And then after that hour in stomach digestion, we bumped the pH up to seven, uh, between seven and nine in order to start our intestinal digestion. So uh, we mimic the whole digestive process of these, um, of these large mouth bass digestive tracts to get our final protein hydrolysis. Um, and then after the hydrolysis, we heat shock those as well to eliminate the enzymatic um, activity, freeze dry them, uh, and then utilize them as our protein source in our feeds. 
So the formulations we use for this study, uh, I, you, the, we actually have three different hydrolysis and that pretty much separates our, four, our five diets. Our first diet was our intact diet, which didn't have any hydrolysis and was completely based on that intact um, fish meal representative pretty much. Uh, then our next four diets were a varying combination of our um, hydrolysis. So we have three hydrolysis. One was done for one and a half hours. One was done for three hours and one was done for six hours. Uh, and that just gives us varying levels of digestion. So the one and a half hour will be less digested, larger protein sizes, and then the six hour to be more digested, smaller protein sizes. So our first hydrolysis protein or diet was A, which had an even level of all hydrolysis. Uh, and then from B, C, and D, B had more small protein sizes, C had more medium protein sizes, and then D had more large protein sizes. So we're testing not only the use of these hydrolysis, but um, the degree of hydrolysis that may work best. Uh, and they were formulated to have a protein level of 62% and uh, lipids 16%. Giovanni, I just want to give you a heads up that you're one minute over. Oh, I am? Oh, crap. Okay. I'll go to this part. Um, do, you want me, do you want me to keep stop then or? Would you at least share with us the results and then yep. we'll go on to the panel discussion? Yes, absolutely. Um, so... For the results, we looked at the uh, average weight, um, length, and survival, so growth and survival. The four, so LF stands for live feed. That was our co-feeding group, and they were fed for, um, they were fed for uh, a one week with our team and dry feed, and then moved to solely dry feed. Um, and they actually performed uh, just as well as the um, live feed group only, which is our team at the bottom, as far as weight and length go. Survival was lower in those groups and we noticed significant mortality right when live feeding stopped. Um, and then for our dry feed groups, which are in whites, those did not receive any live feed. Um, and the weights, lengths and survival was obviously was significantly lower compared to that. So uh, we didn't really get the desired um, effect that we wanted, but with the co-feeding with Intact and Hydro, we did see um, a little bit improved growth uh, in length which is important. And then also another key note is that the, actually the intact protein for the, um, for the dry feeding group uh, actually performed better than some of our hydrolysis, which is interesting considering um, it hasn't worked too well before. But when we look at our deformities, which is um, another important factor in this whole thing, uh, the two tallest groups are our intact groups, the live feed intact, and then just the solely uh, dry feed intact group had significantly higher mortalities compared to the all, all the other groups. Um, and our live feed hydro co-feeding group uh, actually had significantly lower um, skeletal deformities compared to all the other groups besides the, um, the Artemia group. So while, we're, while the intact um, diet improved growth a little bit over the hydrolysis, the hydrolysis significantly reduced uh, these skeletal deformities, which is important to producing high quality uh, larval individuals. So from there, it's just about uh, finding the optimal balance between intact protein and hydrolysis. Too much hydrolysis is, can be detrimental to growth and too much intact can be detrimental to growth. So it's about finding the optimal balance between um, those two protein sources to help reduce the um, occurrence of deformities and then also reduce the um, or also improve the amount of growth, however much we can. Uh, so yeah, and I can talk about this in the panel so I can finish up there. So I can, I can go to questions now. Thank you, Giovanni.